We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Use the question bar uh, within the WebEx client to enter questions and comments as they come to you. The speakers will address the questions at the end of the presentation. If you like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org. And now let's get started. <clears throat> our speaker today, our speakers today are uh, Tanya Fersheim, uh, the Content and Applications Manager at the Fenway Libraries Online. Scott Anderson, Information Systems Librarian and Associate Professor at Millersville University, and Doreen Harrell, Manager for Library Technical Services at Lehigh University. And with that, I'm going to uh, pass this over to Tanya to get started with our presentation today. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm hoping that you can hear me. Um, actually, I'm going to move back over to the Live Event Center. Okay. Just to verify, um, Tanya, we are hearing you. Okay, good. Thank you, Michael. This is my first webinar as a host, um, as a panelist, so um, we're still working out some of the mechanics. All right, good morning. Um, I am here to talk to you a little bit about some uh, folio topics and strategic goals for specifically for small institutions rather than mid-size. I am Tanya Fersenheim, the Content Applications Manager at Fenway Libraries Online, also known as FLOW. Uh, Fenway Libraries Online is a consortium of 10 small academic and cultural institution libraries in downtown Boston. I've worked in systems since I finished library school about 20 years ago. I first worked uh, for an ILS company and then I moved into academic libraries. So I've been working with ILSs for what feels like forever. At Flow, I'm part of a four-person team that deploys and manages a wide variety of both vended and open source systems for our consortium members. And until recently, I was the manager of library systems at Brandeis University, where also at Brandeis, I was part of a four-person team doing pretty much the same work. Choosing between commercial and open source is a continual tension in my line of work. I'm not going to uh, go into an exhaustive pros and cons list for open source versus commercial because I feel like there's a lot of information out there already. But I would like to touch on some of what I think are the main pros for each side of the argument, the ones that I feel the most compelling. For commercial, uh, the cost of the software can be easier to justify. A major barrier to adopting open source software is that it typically shifts your big costs from software to people. People costs can be much harder to get budget commitment for than paying an invoice. For implementation training uh, and things like that, having access to staff who know the software really well and can install it and train you on it is very attractive. Access to documentation that you didn't have to write yourself is also theoretically awesome. In theory, there's also someone other than us who's ultimately responsible for making sure that the software works, someone that when it's broken, we can turn to and say, fix it, and they need to help us. And it's also, we're also theoretically less affected by staff turnover with commercial software. Um, and by this, I mean that in a small shop like mine, open source can be unsustainable. We're not really all interchangeable cogs. We have different skill sets and abilities, and it only takes one of us leaving for a new job to torpedo a project, especially an open source one. Having a vendor to fall back on during temporary skill shortages can be a lifesaver. On the open source side of the equation, I'm going to mention cost of the software. Uh, it may look like I'm contradicting myself here, but I promise that I'm not. The lack of upfront license cost and the ability to hide your ongoing costs in people can allow you to implement something quickly and with less obvious budget impact. People time is less obvious as money being spent than paying an invoice. And you're then, of course, up against the problem of having shifted your costs from software to people, but with an already implemented system that people already know and are using, you can often find ways to make do. Flexibility and do-it-yourself 
we can make the software do what we want it to do by modifying or adding on to it. If we don't like a feature, we can change it. If there's a feature missing, we can make, what, make it ourselves. If there's a bug not getting fixed fast enough, we can fix it ourselves. And all of this without having to compete with other customers during the user enhancement process. Autonomy. Um, there's a movement afoot in the software industry to move everything into the cloud. Things like Adobe Creative Suite, Office 365, and Exlibris Alma. Relinquishing local control can be problematic when you no longer have control over when upgrades happen, what gets installed, where your data lives, and who can actually access your data. So a system like Folio has me wondering, what if I don't need to choose uh, between all of these seemingly conflicting pros? Obviously, choosing between commercial and open source can be difficult. Um, each has some major benefits and some major drawbacks. Flow is currently a shared ILS consortium with all of the benefits and drawbacks that come with that. When we're thinking about a new ILS, we ask ourselves questions like, would hosted or locally installed serve us best? Multi-tenant versus single tenant? Would more siloing be better? What if we wanted to commingle some of our data but not all of our data? With a traditional ILS, our needs in these areas define the list of systems that we have to choose from. Folio removes those particular constraints because Folio can be on the list regardless of how we answer those questions. A small shop committed to open source lives or dies on its ability to hire and keep a single developer. We could opt for doing development and hands-on management when we had the people resources and falling back on vendor support when we were underpeopled. We could get our problems addressed in a timely fashion. We could do it ourselves. We could pay someone to do it for us. We could have a hackathon. Not having to compete against the needs of other libraries to get our local needs met is very attractive and can be an efficient way for us to run our system. So there are probably some cynics out there who have been grumbling at the notion that Folio can't possibly be everything that the people, the idea people are claiming can be, and they're grumbling that it's a unicorn. Well, I'm here to tell you that I believe unicorns are real. When we were in Iceland a couple of months ago, we encountered rainbows absolutely everywhere we went. And this could have been lucky weather, or because we all know that unicorns poop rainbows, I choose to believe it was evidence that unicorns exist. So now that we've established that unicorns are real, what kind of unicorn am I looking for? I've touched on some of the folio benefits in terms of mechanics, but beyond the mechanics are what I think of as the bigger questions and opportunities. With flexibility, a platform like Folio could allow us to run multiple CERC modules or cataloging modules so that each of our libraries could have their own specific local needs met. We have the ability to write or find an app to meet a hyper-local need for a specialized library like the Museum of Fine Arts. A major systems vendor is unlikely to commit development hours to something super specialized. For in the terms of collaborative collection management, um, our collections can't be comprehensive anymore. Not that they ever really could have been, but it was a goal that some of the libraries were striving for. Cooperative collection development and retention partnerships are springing up all over the place. Some of them are official, some of them are ad hoc, some are long-term, some are short-term. Data sharing and interchange for these types of endeavors is a challenge, and we keep finding ourselves wanting to use and reuse our data in ways that our ILS vendors haven't envisioned. Our vendors all give us tools for exporting MARC records, but too often that's the extent of the ways that they sanction export and reuse of our own data. We need more access to our data unconstrained by our software vendor. I'm also seeing a reduction in the centrality of the ILS. Some core functions still need to occur inside the ILS, but more and more of our workflows are outside the ILS. Many of us already do our ordering in external systems. We manage patron authentication in external systems. And our software constrains our workflows. It always does. And we'd like to choose our own constraints. Librarians are no longer just in the library biz. We're in the repository biz, the learning management system biz, the research data biz. We need a platform that enables us to connect the services we need to provide wherever those services live. I also think that we're seeing a commoditization of ILS functionality. It's kind of going the way of email. It's not what sets us apart from other libraries and other institutions. How we check out a book or generate a purchase order is not what makes us us. 
And finally, I see Folio as a major opportunity for small libraries like ours to make contributions. We don't have to go outside our existing skill set to participate. We can learn a new language if we want to, but we don't have to. If we already do a lot of scripting in Perl, we can write things in Perl. Small shops are often only resourced to be consumers of open source. A team the size of mine might be able to participate fully in this type of ecosystem. We could give back. We're a small shop, but we have big dreams. So a lot of what I've just said is an echo of things that I was saying at the Charleston conference back in November. So what I'm, you're probably wondering like, what have I been doing since then? Um, <clears throat> I'm being fairly hands off at the moment. I've been reading the discussion site, I've been reading the Slack channels, attending webinars, basically just trying to keep abreast of how Folio is developing, what the timeline is, and you know what it might mean for our future at Flow in terms of systems implementation. I've been monitoring for ways to get involved with a SIG or a focus group, and I'm especially looking for bite-sized projects to get involved in, something that a small institution can carve out a few hours here and there to be able to participate because we're never going to be able to you know, devote a person full time to doing folio development, but there are opportunities for us to do small things here and there. I've been talking to the folio community on Slack, I've been tweeting, um, and a lot of what I've been doing is thinking about what small libraries and consortia need from a platform like folio. Flow is in a good position right now with a stable supported ILS and we have the luxury of adopting a watchful waiting approach. So that's pretty much what we're doing right now. Um, and with that, I would like to pass the presenter role back to Scott, if I can find the right window. There it is. Scott, are you ready? Oh, he stole it. Okay, there we go. And, um, okay, now can everybody hear me? Because my phone just... Scott, we can hear you. Okay. Yep. All right. So uh, here I am at Millersville University, mid-sized institution. Um, we have a um, little bit about me. Uh, I am nominally the information systems librarian here at the institution, uh, but really what soaks up a lot of my time are increasingly those subject specialties. Uh, as we here as an institution uh, and in the library as a department have moved much more uh, intentionally to more direct engagement with students. So uh, those subject specialties and everybody in our library has uh, some of those um, are increasingly moving to the fore. Uh, however, I still have library operations responsibilities and those are sort of listed there. Um, and a little bit about the institution here. As a mid-size, we're uh, just shy of 6,600 FTE. I don't know where that point for FTE student is. Uh, predominantly an undergraduate institution, um, about 500 graduate students in a good year. Uh, we've recently launched some doctoral programs, practical doctorates, uh, 25 master's degrees, and 100 baccalaureate kinds of programs. So geographically, we're just outside Lancaster, PA, near uh, west of Philadelphia. So. That's a little bit about me and where I am going in the library here and a little bit about the institution so you've got some context about that mid-size. Um, as I was saying, some of the things that I'm responsible for in addition to those library kinds of things are, uh, again, increasing levels of direct contact with students, um, primarily through instructional activities and uh, appointments for student contacts. Uh, I'm also being pulled in additional directions for adjacent services and technologies, um, and some of those are listed there. And because we have been under some extreme cost pressures recently, we're doing lots of things on analysis of content. Um, so that's one of the areas where uh, we're spending increasing quantities of time sort of behind the scenes, which sort of moves into that collections and content as a service to our community. So. We're looking for ways to add uh, ability to um, meet user needs when we recognize them. All right, so.
All right. Um, so we're uh, basically looking at statics budgets. Um, we're looking at operational costs very closely, and our ILS fits clearly into that operational uh, mindset there. Uh, our physical collections are shrinking uh, considerably. Uh, last fiscal year, we ordered about two dozen physical objects. This year, we're going we're gonna to hit probably about 100. Uh, but we are not adding volumes of things that you traditionally have managed in an ILS. And uh, we basically are generating collection budget dollars to meet student and research needs by approving uh, efficiencies and operations and sort of adopting more of a service approach, generally speaking. So uh, what's attracting us to the idea of this as a platform, uh, if we're using it obviously as an ILS outright, um, hosting options, because uh, you get possible synergies, both technical and contractual, uh, from our perspective, if you can use a vendor who you've already worked with for some uh, other services. Um, and also the idea that we basically, I think, will improve our odds to pay for the kinds of support or service levels uh, that are more in keeping with what we would actually be using. Um, locally, we think we can get away with a pretty stripped down implementation for what we actually need. Uh, which is basically CERC, NZIP, and Z3950. We're not convinced we necessarily need a standalone OPAC. Uh, we certainly don't need an acquisitions model module or anything like that, though we're probably inclined to get one with anything that we would be looking at. Uh, and that's a function of the fact that we've adopted the approach of doing almost all of our acquisitions work right in our university's um, acquisitions uh, workflows. So there's no more of us trying to mesh with the university system. We just do it right there. Um, and we've had some sort of philosophical conversations about cataloging uh, and whether we need to do that in an ILSE kind of type system or do that as a standalone. So uh, we also get the opportunity then to perhaps develop or find uh, what we want or need that perhaps isn't there, uh, back to Tanya's point, that you know, we have some more opportunities to perhaps meet our local needs or oddities than we would in a larger uh, standard mainstream kind of uh, ILS, LSP environment. Uh, and the other thing that makes things uh, attractive is contracting with third parties for specific deliverables um, and or partnering with other institutions. Uh, again, one of the things in my 20 plus years of working with ILS is, is you've got to go through this long, horrible process to get anything uh, move to the fore and developed with an open approach uh, like Folio, you at least have the opportunity to say, I want to do this, or I'm looking for a small team of institutions that are interested in doing this. And you can sort of manage the complication by keeping things small uh, and still plugging them in there. Um, and again, as, an, as a hands-on kind of institution, uh, where we're trying to get students to participate directly in what we would call research or active learning kinds of procedures, this does also open up an absolute opportunity for certain students at the university to be participating very directly in the developing uh, development of a, a community resource or a, a module in this case. Um, which again is one of the sort of attractions, uh, plug and play modularity, uh, and I've increasingly been thinking about the possible widgetry um, in the sense of thinking of this not so much as an LSP, but perhaps as a marketplace where we can look for widgets or services that do specific kinds of things uh, with the content that we have or will do kinds of things with um, content that we provide it or uh, will do things adjacent to content that we have. Um, and also thinking about this from the standpoint of if it's that modular, perhaps we have the opportunity to, to plug these services and functions into any context, not just a library-centric context, because uh, we all know that everybody starts looking for all of their research needs at the library website. We know that, you know, it's been documented lots of times, um, and they never use Google or anything like that. So the ability to spread ourselves out into other avenues and channels throughout the university has some attraction to it as well. And finally, there's the, the implementation of non-library kinds of services that, let's face it, our students uh, are expecting things to be slicker than they always have been in the library space. Uh, and lots of those things come from outside the library space. So the ability to plug those in in a more seamless fashion would be uh, very much welcomed. So in the grand scheme of things, those are the kinds of things that uh, are drawing me as a, 
as a person responsible for these kinds of things at a, at a medium-sized institution to the idea of uh, adopting in part or full uh, the, the modularity and the approach that is folio at the moment. So at this point, I hand it off to or somebody has taken it from me, and we're good. Oops, sorry about that. Doreen, you should be set up. Good. Can you see my screen? Is that right? Doreen Harold, Manager, Library of Technical Services. You see that? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so yes, my, hi, my name is Doreen Harold, and I manage Library of Technical Services at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, not too far from where Scott is, probably about an hour or so away. And I just wanted to take some time to um, provide you with some information about where we were, where we are, and where we are going at Lehigh. Um, I think Tanya and Scott did a really great job with their presentations, and, and I would reiterate a number of things that they said. Um, I do want to try to give you some additional information, too. So, But first, let me start with just um, giving you some background into Lehigh, why we would be involved in this presentation even. We're a mid-sized institution. Um, Lehigh was founded in 1865 by um, a man named Asa Packer, who was he was instrumental in the development of um, railways in northeastern Pennsylvania, and he had an interest as president of the Lehigh Valley Railroad in ensuring that his staff was properly educated. And um, with that kind of background, we see that Lehigh, one of their strongest majors is engineering. Um, you can see there we have about 7,000 students, 5,000 who are undergrads, and about 2,000 who are grads. And engineering is, like I said, one of those fields that we see a large, um, a large amount of the student body involved in, as well as in business and, and in the arts and sciences, too. Um, on campus, we have two libraries, and we also have a, a storage facility that is not on the main campus, but is just a bus ride away. Lehigh has a, a bus service, um, which we're very fortunate to have because we're on a mountain. So it's not always easy to get from one place to another. So if we ever need to get anything from the Library Materials Storage Center, um, we could just take a bus there. And we're finding, too, that some of our work is um, moving there, and that's because a lot of our materials are starting to move there as well. Um, just as Scott had said, we too are seeing our physical collection shrinking, not only in the acquisitions of new materials, but also over the past couple of years, our collection development librarians have been involved in a, a multi-year process in which they're analyzing our physical collection and are withdrawing little used items. So. At the same time, though, we've also seen an increase in our online resources, acquisition of online resources. Um, we're starting to get more electronic book packages as well as electronic journal packages. So we're seeing an increase in reliance on batch work. Um, and I like to think of that term batch work as a very general term that has impact throughout um, our technical services team, you know, instead of acquiring one title at a time or acquiring a whole collection of titles, hundreds and sometimes thousands of titles at once, and what the implications of that are with um, licensing and, and the fact that oftentimes we don't own these things but we're just leasing them. Um, but then it also affects cataloging and, and the batch work of that, you know, moving again from one item at a time to um, finding a file of records or creating a file yourself by batch searching in a bibliographic database and then batch processing that file and batch loading it. Um, so these are things that probably most of you can identify with as well that you are seeing at your own library. Um, 
But one more point about Lehigh, we're, we're a merged organization. Um, some of you might remember, I, I think pretty much in the 1990s, we were seeing a number of institutions experimenting with um, merging their organizations, and that's what Lehigh had done as well. And um, we're still a merged organization today, so we're what's known as LTS, the Library and Technology Services of the university, and that includes the library and computing and faculty development, instructional technology, telecommunications, networking, as well as other things. And with all those different services, um, LTS is a team of about 180 people, uh, about 40 of which are specific to the library. So where we had been, we had been using Circe Dynex since 1995. Um, the last um, installation that we had was Circe Dynex's Horizon. Um, we also had seen, as I noted already, um, since maybe the early 2000s, an increase in the acquisition of electronic journals and electronic books. And as, again, most of you probably recognize at your own place, the, the management of the, these materials often become unwieldy. There's just new points of, uh, of management of those things that we have to do, and our systems don't really seem to support that very well. Here at Lehigh, we're now in the process of using um, CORAL. Um, that's a, an electronic resource management tool. And we're just at the beginning of it, so um, we now have created an additional system that we're using outside of our library system. And that's my third point there. We've seen the growth of library systems over the years, again, as you probably have as well. And that was one of the, the big movers for us to join the OA project. This was back in 2008. Um, Duke University had issued a call looking for partners to be involved in the OA project. Um, they had received a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and were looking for additional libraries to join them in making that first step of just trying to um, determine if there's a feasibility to developing an open library environment, uh, an open source library system. And we had been, um, I think, the second smallest institution involved in the OLA project. Most institutions were large university research libraries. We also had two national libraries involved. There was the um, National Libraries of Canada and the Australian National Library were, were members during that first phase as well. Um, but we were, like I said, probably the second smallest institution that was involved with that. So as I said in the first slide, or the previous slide to this, that we had been using um, Circe Dynex since 1995. So starting from that first phase of Olay up until 2014, there was time spent in developing the open library environment and we did migrate to that in August of 2014. Um, actually, three libraries total did migrate to Olay. There was us, there was the University of Chicago, and there was SOAS, part of the University of London. Um, so we migrated then, and we're still using it, and for us, we, we're doing fine on it. And it did create some situations for us that were very positive. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that could enable you to um, to build new skills and to analyze your policies. And for us, it was that change into Olay that did it for us. So with skill development, we um, had to, we started learning new skills about um, how to access our data. Um, and it was something that was actually very exciting. Um, for example, our, our metadata librarian um, has been um, learning about um, SQL scripts and, and um, um, Python. And, and just these different tools are not only enabling her to access the data within Olay, but she's also finding that 
that knowledge is increasing her ability to deal with data both in Olay and outside of it if she's able, when she pulls it out and needs to make changes to it. Um, we also are able to utilize vendor supplied files. Now that's not something that um, we didn't have the ability to do before in Circe Dynix, but in Circe we would have had to purchase an additional module to do that and it was cost prohibitive for us. So now in Olay, we were able to get files from vendors for new acquisitions, so we we're able to load in bibliographic records and then have automatic generation of purchase orders. And that has alleviated some of that one at a time work for us that we had done before where whenever we order, order an item, we have to look in a bibliographic database to find that bib record and then import it in and then uh, manually create a purchase order. And so that work has been, as I said, alleviated because that functionality was built directly into Olay. So that's been a great um, boon for us. Um, also with Olay, in the configuration of circulation policies, it had us go back and look at the policies that we did have and question them and, and revisit them and make some changes that, to them to help um, create a better experience for our library users. And then also in LA, we our library system staff were able to um, develop communications with Olay and other systems outside of Olay, for example, um, we have a consortial database that we use and, and one of our staff was able to build um, a tool to enable NSIP so that um, information is moving outside of Olay to that external database, as well as um, getting patron files in, you know, whenever we get a, a new group of students coming in every year, the, the stream of information from the registrar to our library system is much smoother now than it had been in the past. So as far as where we are going, um, for Lehigh we don't have any concrete plans at this time to migrate to Folio, at least for the next couple of years. You know, at present we're, we're getting along fine with Olay and Olay, there is some development still going on. Um, we're expecting that Olay 3.0 will be released sometime this year and we're planning to upgrade to that when it is released. We don't have any major concerns with the system and as I noted in the previous slide, we're actually benefiting from the fact that we did migrate to Olay. And our Olay experience, it laid the groundwork that is just looking forward to the development of Folio. Um, LA is by no means perfect, and as anyone would, we do have uncertainty when you're involved in building something that doesn't yet exist. But our experience with OLA provided us with a, such an experience that it's driving us forward to Folio. And something that I'm personally interested in with Folio is the concept of the App Store. I first heard about that App Store concept in relationship to Folio at the 2016 Code for Lib conference in Philadelphia. Um, Sebastian Hammer of Index Data had presented on this and um, on Index Data's involvement with Folio and mentioned the App Store there. And it, it stuck with me because I myself, I'm an active user of my smartphone, so let me just try to explain a little bit on my terms to see if something it's something that you can relate to as well. Um, you know that when you get your smartphone, it comes loaded with an operating system. And then there's some basic applications that allow you to use the phone for general purposes, like calling people and reading your email and browsing the web. And then there's the App Store, and it's there you can find additional applications. You know, for example, like a Sudoku app, that's one I use sometimes. <laughs> So some of those applications, you'll, you'll be able to download them for free. Some are ones that you have to pay for. Some of them are on the freemium um, model, which you get some basic functionality once you download the app. But if you want to increase the functionality, you have to pay for that. Um, so for example, once I exhaust the games on my freemium Sudoku app, I can pay to get additional games and functionality if I want to do that. Um, over the years, we've probably made 
oh, I, well, I should say Folio is going to do something similar to that, and that index data is right now building the structure of the system, of the Folio system. And it's a structure that will provide basic library services that will be delivered while using Folio, and it will also enable others to build additional services on top of that, like you would find in an app store. Um, over the years, we've probably all made casual observations and seen articles about systems development and staffing in libraries. For example, the idea of the accidental systems librarian, you know, being that person with an education in librarianship who's then thrown into systems management and has to learn on the job how to do that job. And we're also seeing libraries hire people without an educational background or experience in libraries, but rather have a background in computer science. At Lehigh, since 2009, we've been able to hire two staff with such backgrounds, and they're wonderful to have around. And seeing them in action during our implementation of Olay gives us confidence in their abilities to work in the environment that Index Data is building, that they will be able to contribute to extending that basic functionality that index data is building for Folio. We're fortunate that they're accessible to us too. You know, they're just down the hallway from us and we have regular meetings with them regarding our, our use of Olay at this time and how things are going. And they're also very responsive to emails. And sometimes we even get to eat lunch with them <laughs> and, and get their ear at those points as well. So these are colleagues that I'm excited to have participating in helping us and the library community too, because they're creating tools that will be accessible through the App Store. And I think the concept of resource sharing is appropriate here. It, you know, it's a concept we often apply to interlibrary loan, but the skills and abilities that each staff has can be shared through the App Store. You know, when I think of, of this kind of idea, I think about Terry Reese and how he shared MarkEdit with the library community. You know, at Lehigh, we're active users of MarkEdit. Every day we're using it and multiple, t multiple staff are using it or learning how to use it. Um, and I think the App Store will facilitate something similar in that kind of resource sharing as libraries building functionalities in Folio that are appropriate for their library can then share that functionality with others who would benefit from it as well. And I'm really excited to see that happen in Folio and the App Store. So I'll now give this back to the host. Great. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, Doreen, and uh, thanks to Tanya and Scott uh, also for the presentation. Um, we have time, we have plenty of time for uh, questions um, uh, to our panelists uh, about uh, their presentations or about their institutions and their engagement with uh, Folio. If you have questions, uh, you can put them into the Q&A box in WebEx uh, or use the uh, Twitter hashtag uh, folio forums uh, to ask questions. So while I wait to see if there are any questions, I'll go ahead and ask one of, of all three um, of the panels. And this is just sort of a very general question, uh, but I'm intrigued. Uh, my, my career has been largely at uh, large research uh, institutions, large research libraries. Um, and I have a pretty good sense of the torturous process we go through at those kinds of institutions to evaluate and make um, strategic technology decisions. One of the things I know about uh, small and mid-sized libraries is that people wear multiple hats, uh, that uh, typically uh, you have um, responsibilities for more than one uh, constrained kind of activity. And I'm interested in how your institutions evaluate and make those strategic technology decisions. Well, I could talk a little bit about Lehigh. This is Doreen Harold talking. Um, our involvement in that first phase of Olay um, 
our, our systems person who um, first caught eye of Duke's call out for members, um, he talked with our, our vice provost, the LTS, the, the organization, the merged organization that I had talked about before. Um, we have a vice, vice provost who is head of it. And so when he saw that call, he had a conversation with him about Lehigh getting involved. And we're fortunate to have a vice provost who's pretty um, forward thinking. And he was pretty excited about it, as well as the person who, who was talking to him, his name was Tim McGarry, um, is very enthusiastic and was able to relay um, the benefits of being involved pretty easily. And with that first year being very, um, you know, it was a one-year commitment. I, I think it was something that was um, easy to get across as um, being an opportunity to explore what the possibilities were with it. And then once we got involved there, it kind of just set the ball rolling. And, and there are discussions that are held between the vice provost and our directors who are involved. And then the directors come to me and, and my colleagues to get our insight into it as well. So we, we do have conversations to think about the pros and cons of being involved. And then the directors relay that on to the vice provost to get the thumbs up. Um, I think we're, we're pretty fortunate in that the directors engage that way with us to get our insights and um, that our vice provost is, is very proactive too. Uh, at, at Millersville here, it's moving something like an ILS or uh, a major technology stack like that forward is really consistently over the last few years been lots of conversations with colleagues in uh, various areas, you know, cataloging access services, interlibrary loan systems, and there's four or five of us that are routinely involved in those kinds of activities and we converse on a regular basis. So we're generally uh, talking to each other and plugged in enough about what everybody's doing that we can have reasonably well-formed in conversations sort of as an ongoing basis and getting to the, wouldn't it be nice if we could, um, and then we can sort of act on those when we see them sort of bubbling up in the marketplace or somebody puts a call out or, or something along those lines that we can sort of, hmm, let's give that some thought. Uh, does that fit in where we're going? Does it make our life easier? Does it free up time? Uh, is that a value add to service to faculty or students? So there's not a big, huge, you know, grand plan, so to speak, uh, but if we think we're doing or moving in a direction that, that we think it, it works well and meshes with the university, um, if it requires a lot of dollars, obviously we'll, we'll kick it upstairs to our assistant provost or associate provost um, and make a pitch for it. Um, but if it's not a big financial resource request, we've got some latitude to make some decisions on our own um, and really have, if we can just get everybody on board locally and, and getting, quote, unquote, everybody on board is, you know, call it an N of five or an N of six, um, we've got some latitude to make some changes and uh, push in new directions. So in that regard, we don't have a, a big bureaucracy that we have to, to navigate through uh, to make some, some changes. Great, thanks. Um, are there any questions from our attendees today? Okay. Um, well, if there aren't any, um, then this will conclu conclude today's folio forum on strategic goals for small and mid-sized institutions. You can continue this conversation at the Folio Discussion website, discuss.folio.org, and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording from today's forum will be posted soon at the openlibraryenvironment.org website. Our next Folio Forum will be uh, in a couple of weeks um, on um, March 1st. 
uh, and it will be on the growth of the folio community with perspectives from the UK. You can go to the same website, folio.org or openlibraryenvironment.org uh, to uh, register for that um, form. I want to thank our speakers again, uh, Tanya, Scott, and Boreen, um, and uh, for their um, insight into how they're thinking about folio and how it meshes with their strategic planning. Thanks for everyone uh, who attended. Have a pleasant rest of your day.